So I will turn it over to him. All right. Well, thanks very much, Eric. And thank you guys very much for the opportunity to talk with you this morning. So in any case, uh, uh, in the uh, spirit of Eric's uh, uh, chronicling uh, the uh, number of, of uh, council meetings and, and so forth. Actually, the uh, intramural program of NHGRI is uh, now in its 21st year, uh, having marked its 20th uh, anniversary uh, last year. And actually, uh, my own uh, uh, tenure at the uh, at the NIH is a little bit longer than that. I actually started at the NIH in 1985 although it may seem uh, incredible to you that someone uh, looking like me could actually have been here for that long, but it's true. Uh, I started actually in the Arthritis Institute and had uh, an interest in uh, the positional cloning of various genes that are involved uh, in the regulation of inflammation. And certainly one of the things that was very exciting uh, to us in the rest of the intramural program of the NIH was uh, the advent of the uh, intramural program of NHGRI, because that really did bring uh, genomic technology and it created a uh, really a critical mass of people who are interested in genetics and genomics uh, to the NIH campus in Bethesda. And so this really was, I thought, uh, a wonderful thing and, and something that really catalyzed uh, the transformation, really, of the, uh, of the intramural campus. And so when I had the opportunity to join NHGRI in 2010, and actually I joined uh, NHGRI on the auspicious date of 10-10-10, October 10th, uh, 2010, uh, it's really been just a fantastic uh, time uh, getting to uh, work with people in NHGRI since then. So in any case, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the NHGRI intramural program. Uh, and uh, just to give you, oops, um, uh, just to give you an overview of uh, the things that we will be talking about. First of all, I'll uh, give you at least a little bit of a raison d'etre uh, for uh, intramural research uh, at the NIH. Uh, secondly, I'll talk to you a little bit about the NHGRI intramural vision uh, and uh, what we do in, in our particular uh, intramural program. Thirdly, I'll talk with you a little bit about the intramural faculty uh, of NHGRI uh, and its organization and recent reorganization. Uh, fourthly, we'll talk about at least a few of the scientific accomplishments of the intramural program, uh, at least a little bit uh, uh, adding to some of the things that Eric talked about a couple minutes ago. Uh, fifth, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how uh, NHGRI intramural science is evaluated, both in the context of the Blue Ribbon Panel uh, review that we underwent uh, back in 2011 and 2012 which, by the way, uh, was chaired uh, by David Page, sitting over across from me in the corner, uh, trying to uh, look inconspicuous with this. Uh, and then also uh, a little bit about our Board of Scientific Counselor, Counselors review of scientific programs. I'll also talk a little bit about uh, the budget of the intramural program and the vicissitudes that we've had to go through uh, with the uh, uh, with the various uh, sequestrations and shutdowns and so forth. And then finally, uh, I'll end uh, with a little bit in terms of new initiatives uh, in the intramural program. So to get started, uh, let's just talk first a little bit about what are the distinctive features of, of uh, uh, research uh, at the uh, intramural program of the NIH. And there are nine things that uh, I've uh, uh, identified here on this slide uh, that I think are important. Uh, one is that the intramural program tends to have uh, an institutional commitment to researchers over projects, more like the, uh, the Hughes Institute. Secondly, there's a quadrennial, uh, heavily retrospective review, which is different from the prospective uh, review that uh, is seen uh, uh, most prevalently in the extramural program. Uh, thirdly, um, uh, because of the fact that usually funding is relatively stable, uh, it allows uh, for long-term studies that require this kind of stability of funding. Uh, and this lends itself then, uh, we hope and we certainly strive for, uh, high-risk, high-reward projects that would be difficult to do with uh, R01 funding. 
Certainly in the intramural program of the NIH, there's critical mass in certain key areas. Certainly genomics now is one of them. Uh, immunology, I would say, is certainly another that uh, is world class uh, in the intramural program of the NIH. And structural biology, I guess, would be another uh, to uh, single out. Uh, certainly one of the uh, justifications for having an intramural program is the idea that uh, researchers uh, at the NIH can at least sometimes uh, uh, turn on a dime, changing their research focus to respond to public health uh, crises such as what was seen in the 1980s with the HIV crisis, for example, and the intramural program really took a leadership role uh, in uh, getting things going in that area. It's also an intellectual home for institute directors and extramural program staff, and so we want to have a vibrant uh, intellectual community for these people to, uh, to be able to take part in. Uh, it's close to the seat of government, and as Eric pointed out, uh, sometimes uh, we, in fact, host uh, various uh, people from Congress and, and the administration, and so it's very important to have uh, really uh, cutting-edge uh, science that's uh, going on here. And then finally, uh, there are specialized resources that are available in the intramural program. And probably the one that uh, comes to mind uh, most prominently is that of the NIH Clinical Center. And this is really a unique hospital uh, in the sense that it is a hospital where every single patient who is admitted is on a research protocol. Uh, and where, in fact, there's no cost to the patient or to the investigator for, for the patient to be admitted. And so this really does then lend itself uh, to doing uh, clinical investigation uh, in uh, a very intensive way. And so the clinical center really uh, has been uh, the, uh, the hub uh, around which a lot of the uh, research uh, at, the, uh, at the NIH intramural program has been done. In terms of the NHGRI's uh, intramural research program, uh, I'd just like to talk about um, five uh, things that uh, our faculty identified as being very important uh, in the process of developing a vision statement uh, back in 2012 as part of the uh, Blue Ribbon Panel uh, review process. First of all, uh, the uh, NHGRI intramural research program uh, really aims to lead the way on the NIH campus in the genetics, genomics, pathophysiology, and treatment of human disease, fostering a deeper understanding of human biology. And as I said, uh, that certainly has been my experience as first an outsider to the Genome Institute, and then certainly this is something that we want to continue. Uh, certainly, the intramural program also wishes to conduct transformative science to develop collaborations among basic clinical and social and behavioral scientists to take full advantage of the intramural environment and the critical mass that we have in certain areas and to catalyze change uh, across, the, uh, across the NIH campus. Certainly in terms of this heat uh, map that uh, Eric uh, uh, had in, uh, in his paper in Nature back uh, a couple of years ago, uh, whereas uh, the overall genetics and genomics community uh, is perhaps uh, more focused in the biology of genomes and uh, the biology of disease right now. Uh, the intramural program, partly because of the accessibility of the resources of the clinical center, uh, perhaps is focused a little bit more uh, in terms of understanding uh, the biology of disease and uh, the science of medicine. So in any case, just a little overview in terms of the faculty uh, uh, in the NHGRI intramural program. Altogether, we have 45 uh, investigators who are our research faculty. Of them, 25 are tenured senior investigators for our tenure track investigators, and this is actually uh, a reduction in the numbers. When I started as the scientific director, we actually had eight tenure track investigators, and over time, uh, some have left, some have uh, graduated to tenured positions, and certainly given budgetary constraints, this is an issue that we'll come back to a little bit later in terms of the future of the intramural program is just uh, being able to set aside the resources uh, for uh, younger investigators. And then finally, we have 16 associate investigators who are more like uh, uh, research adjunct faculty at a medical school 
Uh, eight of them have some independent resources of their own. Uh, eight uh, work primarily for other uh, tenured investigators. And then in addition to that, we have 10 adjunct investigators shown here uh, who are uh, actually hold their primary appointments in other uh, institutes uh, but have a uh, affiliation with uh, the NHGRI intramural program. So in any case, this is just a, a, uh, a pictorial showing uh, all of the faculty uh, that I just um, summarized on the previous slide. Uh, two major uh, events this past year in 2013 with regard to the faculty. First of all, we had the, uh, 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 the joining of the faculty of Gary Gibbons, who many of you know is the uh, director of uh, NHLBI. Uh, he, of course, uh, recently came to the NIH campus. He's an expert on cardiovascular uh, genetics and health disparities, uh, and uh, he chose uh, to uh, locate his lab in NHGRI's intramural program. And I think that just the fact that we have not only uh, Gary Gibbons as one of our faculty members, but also Harold Varmus uh, at his uh, request and Francis Collins is just uh, a vindication of the, of the quality of uh, the intellectual environment in NHGRI's intramural program and uh, it says something about the administrative uh, support that NHGRI is able to provide as well. Uh, we did have one of our uh, investigators, a tenure-track investigator, Yardena Samuels, uh, who took a tenured position at the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot uh, during this uh, last year uh, as well. So one uh, new tenured uh, member of the faculty and one person uh, leaving. In any case, uh, over the last year, uh, just as Eric uh, has uh, reorganized the overall structure of the, uh, of, uh, the NHGRI uh, writ large, uh, our intramural program has also undergone a, a reorganization, which was at least in part uh, recommended by some of the outside uh, advisory bodies that we have. And the goals, basically, of doing this reorganization were to uh, uh, increase scientific synergy amongst investigators to advance the careers of some of our uh, mid-level uh, faculty, uh, certainly some element of succession planning as well. And as Eric, Eric uh, mentioned a little while ago, Larry Brody has uh, taken on the position of uh, division director uh, for the uh, division of uh, 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 genomics and society. Uh, and because of that, the genome technology branch uh, has been phased out and the members of the genome technology branch have been located in, in other branches. Uh, we have now two new, uh, rather three new branch chiefs uh, in, the, in the institute. Julie Segre, uh, whom Eric mentioned uh, with regard to the Service to America award uh, that she received this last year. Uh, Pam Schwartzberg, uh, who is uh, an expert on uh, the genetics of various immune diseases, and Charles Rotimi, uh, whose uh, work concentrates on health disparities uh, research and uh, the genetics of cardiovascular and metabolic disease uh, in the African and African American populations. Uh, certainly in this process, we tried to more clearly delineate the role of the branch chief in terms of scientific leadership and mentorship. Uh, and uh, we have an expanded uh, leadership group with now nine branches in terms of seven, uh, as we had before. Uh, I'll just mention briefly that uh, we have eight cores uh, within the NHGRI uh, intramural program. And certainly these cores have taken a leadership role on campus in terms of disseminated uh, genomic thinking and genomic technology. For example, the bioethics core certainly has taken a leadership role in terms of helping uh, investigators and other institutes to think about uh, issues of informed consent uh, in uh, genomic uh, studies, whether it be uh, uh, genome-wide association studies or whole exome sequencing. Uh, the Bioinformatics and Scientific Programming Core uh, has a number of courses that they offer for the broader uh, community, and including one uh, that uh, uh, is 
currently starting, uh, the, at least the most recent uh, edition of which had over a thousand people signed up on campus and uh, <coughs> videos of that course are kept on YouTube and there are literally hundreds of thousands of views of uh, the lectures in this course. So it really is uh, something that disseminates uh, genomic uh, uh, thinking and technology, not just to the, the uh, NIH campus, but in fact to the broader community. And several of these other cores, of course, have had uh, a major role in terms of disseminating these technologies to others uh, at the NIH campus. Uh, another feature of the intramural program is NISC, uh, the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center, uh, which was founded several years ago as a medium-sized genome sequencing center that provides, at least at this point, uh, next-gen uh, DNA sequencing and sequence analysis. It has a budget of around $7 million a year. And Jim Mulliken uh, is the director. As you can see, there's a number of different sequencers uh, that are uh, available. And uh, last uh, year, uh, NISC uh, produced about uh, 45 terabases of high seq output to 55 uh, principal investigators in 11 different institutes. Again, underscoring the fact that uh, NHGRI really does uh, serve uh, a broad role uh, for a number of intramural programs at the NIH. Eric also mentioned uh, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, and of course the Undiagnosed Diseases Program uh, was the progenitor of that. Uh, this was established by uh, NHGRI clinical director Bill Gall back in 2008, uh, and Bill had the vision of attracting patients to the NIH uh, with seemingly inexplicable conditions uh, referred throughout the country, uh, performing comprehensive both clinical and molecular gene genetic analyses of these uh, patients and discovering a number of uh, heretofore unknown molecular lesions defining new genetic diseases. And of course, it is uh, now the, um, uh, the uh, parent, if you will, of the Undiagnosed Diseases Network uh, of the Common Fund. So just a few highlights, uh, some of which uh, Eric has talked about, but others uh, not, uh, just to give you a flavor for some of the things that are going on scientifically in the intramural program. Uh, here is a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last summer uh, from Bill Gall's group on uh, uh, a gene, VPS45, uh, which is, encodes a transporter molecule that transports, among other things, uh, adhesion molecules to the cell surfaces of white blood cells. Patients who have uh, loss of function mutations in this uh, gene have an immunodeficiency, have a problem with uh, neutrophil function, and in, in particular neutrophil uh, adherence and migration, uh, and so these patients have a, uh, uh, an immune deficiency. Uh, a second uh, clinically related uh, paper is one that uh, Les Biesecker uh, co-authored. Uh, it was a uh, uh, opinion piece uh, uh, in uh, uh, JAMA uh, dealing with reporting uh, incidental findings uh, uh, in the clinical uh, setting. And of course, Les has had, Les Biesecker has had a major uh, leadership role in this area through the ClinSeq initiative uh, that he started and certainly uh, uh, has participated in a number of, of the um, uh, uh, approaches to this, including the American College of Medical Genetics uh, list of, of uh, actionable uh, variants that should be reported. Another uh, uh, important paper from the intramural program is one from Julie Segre's uh, group uh, that was published in Nature uh, last year uh, dealing with uh, the fungal uh, microbiome uh, on the human skin. And then, uh, as Eric pointed out uh, in his uh, comments, uh, Julie and Evan Snitkin uh, in her lab, uh, as well as uh, Tara Palmore uh, and David Henderson from the Clinical Center uh, were involved in a uh, very important uh, study identifying uh, basically the uh, transmission of uh, a uh, 
resistant organism through the clinical center and uh, effectively dealt with that and really established a paradigm uh, for how to do this uh, in clinical practice. Other uh, important papers uh, from the intramural program, here is uh, one from Pam Schwartzberg's group uh, defining a new immunodeficiency disease uh, caused by uh, mutations in PI3 kinase. Uh, these patients have um, uh, EBV and CMV uh, infections and have a problem with uh, the formation of the immunologic synapse. A paper from uh, Ingza Yang's group uh, dealing with heterotopic ossification. Uh, this is actually a very important problem in some of the uh, uh, returning veterans from the Middle East uh, who have had amputations and actually uh, at least some of these individuals develop calcifications uh, at the stump of their amputation which can be then very, very painful to them uh, with their prostheses and uh, Ingza has had uh, a major interest in identifying the molecular pathways uh, that lead to heterotopic ossification. A couple of papers uh, from uh, the husband-wife team of uh, Joan Bailey Wilson and Alec Wilson uh, dealing with various genome-wide association studies uh, that they've done uh, over the course of the last year on uh, myopia uh, and on uh, craniosynostosis. Uh, a couple of papers from Charles Rotimi's group uh, dealing with um, uh, body mass index in uh, individuals of African ancestry and Charles's uh, continuing contribution to uh, the Thousand Genomes Project. A couple of papers from tenure track investigators, one of them Chuck Venditti, uh, who's done uh, uh, really incredible work uh, developing a cohort of patients with uh, various uh, metabolic acidemias and identifying the molecular basis of those diseases. Uh, and then Daphne Bell, another tenure track investigator uh, in the uh, institute uh, who's been uh, looking at uh, whole exome and whole genome sequencing of, of uh, endometrial uh, tumors. Uh, and then here, uh, a paper from Steve Parker, a postdoc in Francis Collins' group, identifying uh, a group of enhancers, stretch enhancers, similar to the super enhancers that Rick Young's uh, group has been uh, looking at and, and identifying uh, their role in, in gene regulation and human disease. And a paper that uh, Eric alluded to uh, from Andy Baxavanis' group uh, on the uh, comb jelly uh, and its uh, sequence. And then here, uh, a set of three papers uh, from NISC, uh, and these are just uh, some of a whole host of papers uh, from Jim Mulliken and the group at the Sequencing Center uh, collaboratively identifying uh, sequence in uh, various non-human primates, uh, the Neanderthal, and then in some cases actually looking at other subjects uh, such as uh, HIV uh, antibodies uh, and uh, coevolution of the virus itself. Um, uh, on, uh, Abashedly, I'm showing uh, three highlights of work from my own uh, research group. One of them, a paper that we published in Nature a little over a year ago, uh, dealing with uh, the biology of uh, NLRP3, uh, which is a gene that we found mutated in a particular kind of inflammatory disease uh, a number of years ago, uh, and the role of calcium and cyclic AMP in signaling through this pathway. This is a very important pathway. Uh, both in a number of rare uh, hereditary uh, disorders of inflammation and also seems to play an important role in more common diseases uh, such as gout and cardiovascular disease. Uh, here a paper that we published in Nature Genetics uh, uh, last spring uh, on a genome-wide association study in Betchett's disease. The interesting thing about that paper is that we found variants of ERAP1 which is a molecule in the endoplasmic reticulum that trims peptides for loading onto HLA class I molecules, and there's actually an, epistat an epistatic interaction between variants in ERAP1 and a particular HLA uh, class I molecule. And then finally, uh, the one that we're most excited about, and this is a paper that will be coming out online in the New England Journal of Medicine next week. Uh, and basically, it is a, uh, a paper that describes a new disease, DADA2, deficiency of ADA2, 
uh, in children uh, with recurrent fevers and strokes, and at least in some cases, polyarteritis nodosum. And ADA2 is actually uh, a, a protein that's at least in function, similar to ADA1, which many of you know of as the gene that's mutated in at least some cases of severe combined immunodeficiency. Uh, but ADA2 actually is a growth factor that's involved both in uh, endothelial uh, integrity and also in the um, differentiation of certain subsets of, of uh, monocytes and macrophages. So in any case, uh, just to uh, turn to uh, a very important topic, and that is evaluating intramural science. Uh, I'll talk about just a little bit about two things. One, the blue ribbon panel uh, process that uh, occurred in uh, 2011 and 2012, uh, chaired by David Page. And I will just uh, give a couple of slides summarizing some of their findings. Certainly, the, the panel did uh, look uh, fairly broadly at the science that's being conducted uh, in the intramural program. This is a review that occurs every 10 years, uh, roughly, uh, and uh, is intended both uh, to take stock of what's going on in the intramural program and make sure that uh, appropriate uh, types and quality of research is being done, and also to think about the future. And so uh, in their report, the Blue Ribbon Panel did say that uh, the uh, IRP remains an outstanding research enterprise, and uh, this is reflected by its scientific productivity, an excellent record of educating and mentoring, uh, enhancement of the broader NIH IRP through the dissemination of <laughs> genomic technologies, the development of an impressive research and clinical faculty, the establishment of a robust research infrastructure, and a spirit of collaboration and collegiality. The panel uh, refrained from uh, being prescriptive in terms of exactly what kinds of things the intramural program should be doing uh, over 10 years, wisely uh, believing that it's very hard to know what kind of science is going to be practiced uh, 10 years from now. But at least in terms of general principles, uh, exhorted us to embrace, uh, to continue to embrace a risk-taking culture, to insist on excellence, to continue to be a change agent on the NIH campus and beyond, and uh, did note one area of, of need, and that is the interpretation of the volume of genome in information that's being captured and its integration with other clinical data. And I'll actually come back to that uh, in a little bit when we start talking about uh, initiatives that were currently undertaking. On a more um, uh, uh, granular basis, uh, the uh, Board of Scientific Counselors, as Eric pointed out, uh, is the body that actually evaluates the science that's going on in the intramural program uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Currently, our BSC is chaired by Tom Hudson, uh, who is uh, the president of the Ontario uh, Institute for Cancer Research. Uh, and then there are eight other individuals who are on the board as well. Uh, each branch within the uh, NHGRI intramural program is evaluated every four years. And certainly we have uh, uh, made this process a little bit more standardized and we hope uh, have made it even more rigorous uh, over the course of the last couple of years, at least in part. Uh, because of the suggestions of our Board of Scientific Counselors and in part uh, uh, because of uh, suggestions of the Blue Ribbon Panel. And so uh, when I uh, meet with the uh, BSC and the ad hoc reviewers, I do uh, uh, tell them that we're really looking for great science. And in particular, I ask them to think of five questions in evaluating uh, the, the uh, scientists and their programs. First, uh, does the work fundamentally change the way that we think about or understand relevant areas of biomedical science? Second, through the development of new methods, does it change the way that we do science? Third, for clinical research, does it change the way that we practice medicine? Fourth, whether clinical or basic, how would the field look if the intramural investigator had not been active for the last five years? And then finally, uh, is the research worth studying uh, with the special resources associated with the IRP? In any case, uh, since I've been scientific director, we have implemented a uh, summative uh, 
uh, rating system uh, of uh, outstanding, excellent, and very good for each of the investigators who is reviewed. And over the course of the last three years that we've been uh, using this system, 17 out of 25 faculty got ratings of outstanding, one got a rating of outstanding to excellent, five excellent, and two very good. And certainly one of the things that the Blue Ribbon Panel uh, asked us to do is to have some sort of process in place if someone uh, did get very good ratings, and we certainly do have that in place now, and, and investigators are up for re-review actually a year after uh, their um, very good rating, and then uh, are totally re-reviewed re two years later. And so we really have uh, taken this uh, very seriously. Turning for a moment to the uh, subject of budget, I will just on one slide uh, summarize at least the, uh, the current budgetary circumstances of the intramural program. Uh, from fiscal year 2010 to 2012, FY 2010 was Eric's last year as scientific director and then uh, the first two years uh, for my scientific directorship, uh, we had a flat budget of $104 million a year. Uh, and from that, uh, $32 million are taken off the top uh, for uh, the maintenance of the clinical center and other uh, central uh, costs uh, associated with the intramural program. In fiscal year 2013, because of sequestration, uh, that figure was cut from 104 million to 100 million, again with the same uh, amount taken off the top in terms of overhead. Uh, in 2014, we budgeted for $98 million, uh, expecting that there would be a second wave of sequestration. Uh, fortunately, that has not happened, as Eric said. Over this period of time, we've converted the way that we do budgeting uh, for individual investigators from a capitated, centrally supported budget model to a bottom line approach where basically investigators are given a set, of amount, set amount of money per year and then they get to choose whether they spend it in personnel or um, uh, services and supplies, figuring that that's, that gives them more uh, latitude to wisely spend their money in times of, of uh, shortage. Uh, overall, we've done 15 percent across the board cuts uh, in individual investigators since 2010, meaning everyone has been cut uh, by that much. Uh, and once we have uh, these descriptors associated with each investigator, then the budgeting will be based on uh, their evaluations. But of course, we want to have it fair. Uh, where everyone has been evaluated uh, in the same way first. Uh, the actual fiscal year 2014 budget, at least from what we understand, uh, will be about $102.5 million. Uh, there are certain mandated expenditures like uh, the 1 percent pay increase uh, for GS uh, employees and certain capital expenses that have been deferred, uh, but we do hope to be able to do at least one recruitment in bioinformatics uh, during this year uh, with uh, some of the extra money that we have. Now turning to new initiatives just for a short time, uh, I'd like to highlight a couple of things. One of them is a uh, sequencing uh, project, the NHGRI Clinical Center sequencing project that uh, actually a, a group of uh, the leadership, the branch chiefs, uh, came up with at a meeting in, in August and Les Biesecker and Jim Mulliken have taken the lead on. So in any case, uh, what basically we're planning to do is to offer investigators in other institutes besides NHGRI uh, whole exome sequencing at NISC uh, on clinical center patients at reagent only cost. And that's roughly half of the cost that investigators in other institutes would be charged otherwise if they were charged for the overhead costs of the sequencing. This is being further subsidized by competitive awards uh, from Michael Gottesman's office so that essentially for those individuals that win one of these competitive awards, uh, they will have whole exome sequencing for their project at no cost. Uh, the sequencing, we are uh, implementing CLIA certified uh, sequencing and Jim Mulliken is, is setting that up at NISC now. Uh, we do plan to return incidental findings uh, to uh, subjects. Uh, and the Genetic Counseling Service will be providing support uh, for, uh, 
for patients that receive those findings. The first year, uh, we're going to do this as a pilot uh, with 1,000 exomes uh, offered, although we hope to expand this as uh, hopefully it, it is uh, widely appreciated on campus and as funds permit uh, so that uh, it may expand eventually to all clinical center patients and would be integrated with some of the deep phenotyping uh, capabilities uh, that are available in other parts of the NIH, such as the Center for Human Immunology uh, and uh, some of the neurology groups who have really uh, top-notch uh, imaging capabilities. Second thing that I'll just mention briefly is the uh, U01 uh, extramural intramural collaboration mechanism. This is something that uh, has been developed over the course of the last couple of years, and it's basically a program that allows extramural investigators to partner uh, with intramural investigators to write a grant application uh, that involves patients that would be seen at the clinical center. And the idea is that the extramural investigator might be conducting uh, laboratory-based research while the NIH investigator would be seeing patients, phenotyping them, and hopefully uh, there would be then some integration uh, between the two. Uh, the, um, the grants are for $500,000 a year for three years, and basically our intramural program will be funding uh, one new application a year so that eventually we'll be funding uh, three at a time. Uh, and uh, simply because of the, the overall orientation of, of NHGRI's extramural funding, uh, these applications should have a strong genomics uh, orientation in order to be funded by NHGRI. There are a number of immediate challenges that uh, we're facing uh, here in the, uh, the intramural program. Certainly one of them is just one that everyone has to face uh, in these uh, uh, constrained budgetary times, and that's maintaining a, a vibrant research and enterprise in an area of flat budgets. Funding the NIH Clinical Center is particularly an important one because, as I mentioned, it really does have uh, a central role in a lot of the research that's being done uh, in the intramural program. And unfortunately, uh, the costs of health care go up regardless of whether the federal budget is flat or not. And so, uh, of course, the concern is that the Clinical Center budget then takes up a larger and larger proportion of uh, intramural funds. Certainly, we also need to stay at the cutting edge of genomic technology and bioinformatics, and that's uh, part of the reason why our first recruit that we'll be doing with some extra money is in these areas. Uh, we want to continue to catalyze genomic medicine and the intramural program, and of course, uh, we need to, uh, in some way, uh, identify a way of liberating resources uh, for new recruitments, since really uh, the age of our faculty is something that's really of, of uh, significant concern to me in terms of the future of uh, our intramural program. Michael Gottesman's office and Francis Collins have also, uh, just within the last couple of weeks, uh, initiated a 10-year planning initiative uh, for uh, the intramural program of the NIH. So each institute with an intramural program is uh, uh, going to review its intramural program and develop a strategic plan. Uh, the main question is, what should the IRP look like, both at the institute level and across institutes, in 10 years, and how can we get there? Uh, e each institute will constitute a review committee of prominent extramural and intramural scientists. For institutes with a recent Blue Ribbon panel review, the current review may be an addendum to the uh, Blue Ribbon Panel review, or maybe we'll have a reunion of the uh, Blue Ribbon Panel or something like that. <laughs> um, the review should address both scientific priorities and operational issues, and institute reports are due at the end of July. Uh, combi and a combined report from the institutes is supposed to be transmitted to the advisory committee to the director in September, and the ACD would be uh, rendering recommendations for the future of the intramural program on December the 12th, 2014. So anyway, that's uh, basically what I have to say. I did manage to do it in 40 minutes, which is what Eric had uh, asked, and so anyway, with that, Excelsior, onward and upward. So 
So, questions for Dan? Comments? Well, I, have, I have a yeah. Party. Yeah, I have a question about how you actually implement the high risk, high reward strategy. I mean, you know, unlike like venture capital where they spread the risk and they know many of the, their investments are going to go extinct. I hear you have kind of a fixed body. You know, you want scientists to produce results, and yet uh, you should almost strive for some reasonable rate of failure as an indication that the high risk strategy is paying off. So I'm wondering how you. Oh, uh, it's a it's a very very um, thorny or uh, tricky question in terms of how to do this because you're you're quite right and certainly as we scrutinize investigators more with the board of scientific counselors and and look uh, more carefully at what their level of productivity is it certainly does encourage people to to go for you know sort of incremental quantum kinds of approaches rather than than um, uh, higher risk, longer term kinds of projects. I guess that really the the only answer that I can give is is uh, you know in talking with investigators and in uh, thinking about you know as we have uh, uh, reviews and and discussions of people's uh, work in the intramural program of of encouraging them you know with the bully pulpit that I have you know of taking on sometimes uh, longer term things. Certainly it's, a, it's an important thing with uh, the tenure track investigators to encourage them uh, to do that kind of thing. Certainly one, my own personal uh, experience with this, which I think Bob uh, can probably remember because he was one of my reviewers back many, many years ago, uh, uh, is that I took on a positional cloning project as what I was doing as a tenure track investigator. And so it was, it was very much a high risk, high reward, long term project. And um, uh, that certainly is my point of view as to what people should do, is to try to identify things that are really important and bold and to go for them. But it, it is, you're quite right hard to actually get them to do it. Bob. Actually, Dan, uh, that was a very, very wonderful pre presentation. Thank you. I wanted to ask you for a comment and then ask you a question. Okay. So the comment is, I've heard from other people, not in your institute, but in other institutes in the intramural program, of um, real problems with morale. Mm -hmm. And not just from the sequestration, but also from an onslaught of regulations coming down that really restrict the ability of scientists to participate in meetings um, and uh, requests for uh, that their PowerPoints that they're going to give at scientific meetings be put up on in the public domain and all, all sorts of things like that. So I wanted to ask you about how, how you're able to maintain morale because it looks like people are, are working, working hard and doing well. And my question for you is, um, have you been approached by the FDA about the NISC Next Generation Sequencing uh, Center not only having to be CLIA approved, but also requiring investigational device exemptions if any of that information is going to go back to patients? Uh, well, with regard to the, your first question, I guess the I don't know if that's the easy question or the second one is the easy question. So, so maintaining morale, I mean, it, it is something that is really uh, one of the most important things that one can do right now with the intramural program. And, and um, you know, I think that part of the um, dealings with that have to do with the fact that we have a very, very uh, flexible and understanding uh, administrative uh, staff in NHGRI who really do uh, put the investigator first. That's not to say breaking rules, but at least uh, being flexible to the extent that they can with regard to these kinds of things. And I think that with regard to the particular issues that you're raising has been very, very important. With regard to the budgetary uh, constraints, you know, the, the way that I've tried to handle that is by being totally uh, transparent and by um, engaging the faculty in whatever decisions we make with regard to, you know, 
cutting uh, programs or budgets or whatever so that it's not something that's coming down from on high but rather something that everybody's engaged in as as you know a common response to uh, to a, uh, an outside threat in a way uh, with regard to the FDA uh, approaching NISC well no we so far we haven't heard that but that may just maybe because we're not into it far enough uh, for that to have happened. Um. It might be worthwhile having a conversation with Anastasia Wise okay. Okay. Um, because uh, the extramural newborn sequencing group has been approached by them. Really? Yeah, and we've been required to put in pre-IDE pre uh, applications, mm -hmm. uh, and they are looking very seriously at any next-generation sequencing platforms, including software, that are used to generate information that's going back to patients. Wow. Okay. Well, that's sobering. Actually, before we, before we take another question, I mean, I, I should weigh in on the on the, the issue about morale a little. I guess, uh, I mean, Bob, and coming from you is 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 of, of relevance because of your longstanding um, presence in our intramural program and have seen various waves of phenomena. You know, and I also have my own vantage point. I mean, Dan's much closer to it on a day-by-day -day basis. I mean, I think there's no question that, you know, recent years, handful of years have just bought, brought a constellation of, of stresses and strains to intramural investigators. I mean, budgetarily is part of it, but some rather invasive uh, uh, attempts at uh, requirements as well as other constraints around travel and et cetera, et cetera. No question. That, and so that said, I'd make two comments. One, I know it's also pretty stressful on the outside. So I think morale in general across biomedical research is not at all time high by any means. When I talk to people, I know lots of funding stress in particular. So I think it's there as well. I think the second comment to make um, is I also think that uh, it's exactly what Dan said. I think what's the negative impact is going to probably be last at NHGRI. And I, I'm probably very biased in saying that. I do think. We have an administrative approach to how we handle some of these things to try to make it as good as possible. I think fundamentally morale has always been higher in our intramural program compared to a lot of other ones for a variety of reasons. So, you know, I think, I, I think it's absolutely a case that it's an issue. I think it's probably more severe in other institutes than it is at ours for probably many reasons. Uh, but, and it's not just the intramural program. I think there's been morale issues across the whole institute and across all of NIH for budgetary reasons, for restrictions on things like travel and so forth, and then, you know, shut down, pay freezes, everything else. So I, but I do think that we work very hard at the leadership, and that's not just Dan and I, it's a whole suite of people to really try our best to, to buffer that as best, as best we can. Tony, I know you had a question. I'm um, looking at the blue ribbon criteria for excellence in the intramural program. It talks about productivity, risk-taking, excellence, but no one has mentioned innovation, which is one of the main criteria for the review of external grants. Um, you may say that's inherent in risk-taking, but the example you give of positional cloning, you may just use standard technology, and the risk is that someone else identifies the gene before you. So I just wanted to know how important innovation was in the way internal investigators are approaching their problems um, to add new value to the general field if they find a new way to do it or a new technology? No, it's a very good point. And certainly, although it wasn't listed on those slides, it is something that we uh, very much uh, value and, and that is uh, emphasized in the evaluations as we currently do them uh, for people. I would say, just with regard to the going back to the positional cloning, you know, I was doing that in the early 1990s, which was at a time when um, the approach was, well, you were involved in it too. It was not totally uh, a standard uh, approach, at least at that time. But anyway, I, I, I certainly hear your point, and I think that it is something that, uh, although not mentioned, is uh, very much a part of, of what we want to encourage. So um, great report, and I want to congratulate you on actually following through on <laughs> some of the things that we all suggested. It makes it feel worthwhile. Um, and you know, my coming back to Marty's question about uh, the risk tape, risk taking. I mean, I think that the having real, you know, something we talked a lot about, having real rigor in that in those every four-year reviews and actually having that be constantly reiterated and, 
and sort of conveyed by the advisors along the way. Um, you know, obviously, risk taking is in the eye of the beholder. It's actually bad. <laughs> um, but then coming back to the question of um, morale and such, and thinking about, um, you know, I guess. Um, uh, my sense is that the morale of a of a faculty is um, is uh, there's there's the underlying issues involve both uh, reality and perception, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know I think it's worth your conveying back to your colleagues that um, you know the it, it's funny the term flat funding. Uh, would have an extremely positive ring in the extramural <laughs> world. Um, I can think of many institutions that would be del delighted to project flat federal funding. Um, uh, <laughs> and it may be, and also thinking about the fact that many of your colleagues are spending rather less of their time obtaining that flat federal funding than their extramural brethren. Um, uh, uh, but and that leads me back to a, a question that we, so at the end of the Blue Ribbon Report, that we raised somewhat delicately, and it's not one that you can really, um, well, I don't, I don't know how you'd like to address it. But of course, a particular vulnerability for the intramural program at NHGRI, and now seeing the new numbers, I would, uh, you know, back at the envelope suggests that you're now approaching 21 percent of NHGRI's budget. And that compares with what I understand to be, generally speaking, about a 13 percent, mm -hmm. perhaps on average, across the other intramural programs. Um, and we also highlighted the, the strong contrast between, as much as, we as, as much as we loved it and supported it, the, you know, the extraordinarily investigator-driven nature of the intramural program stands in such stark contrast to the relatively top-down nature, uh, you know, strongly top-down nature of the extramural program at NHGRI. And so if you juxtapose those two things, um, uh, is this actually a question that's floating um, uh, across the campus, one that you have to answer to? Um, I, I'd just be curious to your, your take on that 21 percent question. Well, uh, certainly it's, it's a question that I've had to uh, think about ever since I started as, as scientific director. And certainly uh, we are, if not at the top, close to the top in terms of percentages of, of um, the total institute budget that's um, dedicated to the intramural program. So um, you know, in terms of my own take on this, certainly I think that it's absolutely critical for us to, to um, justify ourselves through the excellence of what we do. And that probably, beyond anything else, is probably the, the, the most important uh, justification for uh, whatever level of funding the intramural program has. I think that you know, one can talk about the long-term, high-risk, high-reward kinds of things, and those certainly are good. But you know, as, as was noted, um, it is hard to, uh, in practice, uh, uh, implement that across the whole intramural program. So I think that excellence, at least to me, is, is the most important uh, aspect of, of all this. Certainly, um, uh, with regard to the overall percentage that, that uh, the uh, NHGRI intramural program is of the total, uh, we are uh, very aware of that, and, and I think that, at least in conversations that Eric and I uh, have had about this, uh, we recognize that it certainly can go no higher than that, and that uh, with time, uh, perhaps if the overall NIH budget starts to go up a little bit, that it would adjust downwards as a percentage uh, if the intramural program were kept relatively fixed while the rest of the institute was uh, allowed to expand. As far as the um, across the NIH uh, campus um, uh, component to your question, for sure, that is something that uh, is 
part of the discussion. It's part of the discussion uh, in Michael and, and Francis's 10-year uh, plan is, is thinking about you know, what is the right size for the intramural program and, and if it is to change, uh, how to get there uh, in a reasonable way. Eric, you may want to. I, I have a couple comments. I mean, first, first thing I would say is to, the direct answer to your question, David, is no, it really hasn't been asked of us very much. I mean, we have not, or else not to me directly, not that I've heard. So I've not, we've not gotten that criticism or there not have been cries for us to decrease it. If anything, I would point out that if anything, our intramural program is increasingly asked to do more and more in the intramural program because of the desire to grow genomics and especially medical applications of genomics in the clinical center. So I think there's, if anything, I've only heard a cry that, oh, if only we could do more, that would be better for the enterprise. Um, so that said, it's something we keep an eye on. I mean, we talked about this um, at multiple levels at, when the Blue Ribbon Panel report came through, both to this council, to our Board of Scientific Counselors. It is no question it's something we is very visible. It's why we keep a very close eye on these reviews. I mean, you know, a fourth of our investigators are rigorously reviewed, you know, once a year because yeah, they get it every four years. And you can see they're doing really quite well. And if that trend would, uh, would change, uh, we might look at things a little bit differently. So, you know, I, and there's a lot of reasons why I still feel comfortable. I don't think the program, you know, legitimately should grow or could grow. There's really no resources to allow it to grow, at least as a percentage. Um, but uh, I don't have strong reasons to think it shouldn't be the current size that it is. Howard? I was curious whether you use the uh, five categories from the 2001 strategic mm -hmm. plan as ways of looking at your portfolio. And if so, um, how are you doing in each of those five bins? Mm -hmm. Well, we do look at it at least to, to some extent, and certainly given the uh, resources that we have uh, for uh, doing uh, clinical investigations, at, as I was mentioning, we really are skewing more towards uh, uh, the biology of human disease and uh, the science of medicine categories uh, there, which is a little bit to the right of uh, at least where the overall heat map is supposed to be uh, at the present time. Of course, if you go back, if you go back six, if you go back before that strategic plan, the difference between intramural and extramural was striking. I mean, there was very little, uh, very little, of, in, in especially in the more clinically oriented domains, going on um, extramurally, and all, a lot of that was going on again because of the clinical center, the nature of it. So, so, if I, but but I think if you actually look at it now, I think they're overlapping much more. Than, than, than previously. Any other questions for Dan? Okay. Thank you, Dan. My pleasure. So. All right. You've earned lunch. So um, I think most of you know the drill. It's one floor up. Uh, please be back. We're a little behind schedule. Please be back no later than 1.30. Let's start promptly then.